Thank you. So my name is Najib Hakim. I work for Intel uh, in the AI products group. And what I want to talk about is a project that we did with NASA uh, last summer. Uh, uh, and uh, it doesn't have anything to do with Spark. Uh, it, <laughs> so it's an easy one. But also, it illustrates Intel's new motto, Intel outside. So <laughs> it's outside Earth. So, uh, I want to acknowledge, first of all, everybody who participated. This is a big team. So from NASA, there were a bunch of uh, researchers, both in the data science as well as uh, space sciences. From Intel, a lot of people who enabled this. And also the Luxembourg, uh, the state of Luxembourg, who also partly funded this effort as well. So every year, NASA runs something called the um, FDL, which is... Uh, the Frontier Development Lab. It's a AI accelerator where they bring in uh, postdocs, PhDs, uh, researchers together, both in the data science and the space sciences. They put them in teams and they give them challenges. And uh, they try to tackle different problems. So you can see on the side some of the problems, like uh, what they have here. So the exoplanets. How can you distinguish exoplanet signatures in, in the noise of space? or um, space weather, for example, how the solar uh, uh, storms affect Earth and all the different effects. A uh, bunch of them, uh, new ones for this year, are Earth observation and, and space debris. They're trying to model how the satellite debris and other debris in, in space are rotating around Earth and trying to figure out if we can more accurately predict potential dangers. And for space satellites, they're trying to figure out where, how we can observe changes in Earth, whether it's cloud formation or volcanoes or new landforms, all these kind of things, in order to assist efforts on Earth, for example, uh, Red Cross or other kind of disaster relief things. So space resources, this is the second year we're gonna sponsor it. It deals about mining on, uh, in the moon uh, for various things. So, uh, why are lunar resources important? Uh, so far we've been mining Earth, and we know exactly, or more or less, what Earth has. There are a lot of things on the moon that can be mined as well, which nobody has paid attention. So, uh, we, uh, we cannot ship, if you want to sustain life on the moon, we cannot ship things from Earth. We have to reuse them locally. So that's the first application. Is, is there enough material to sustain life? to build a research lab over there and to be able to live there for a while. The second application is, can we reuse some of these resources there to repair satellites or other things near the moon? And the last thing is, is there anything that's worthwhile, that's worth bringing back to Earth uh, to, to use here, such as maybe expensive uh, metals or things like that. So the resources that are available on the moon are very diverse. So rare earth is one example. Um, helium-3 isotope is important because it can fuel a fusion reaction. Uh, so it produces energy and hydrogen as well. You can use silicates. Silicates is like sand. It's the same material that's on earth as well. But on the moon, it has also additional um, volatiles that, are, that can be mined, like selenium, tellurium, sulfur, things like this, that can be used to build alloys. And the last thing, of course, is water. Uh, that's essential for us to be able to sustain a fairly long period on the moon. So that's really the, uh, the problem. Uh, and then we focus more specifically on, on, on water, but the problem can be similarly defined for others. So where is water on the moon? Uh, the moon in general is fairly dry, but there may be reservoirs hidden in some areas. These areas are typically permanently shaded regions happening deep in the, in the poles and in deep craters where they never see the sun. Um, because of these regions are very, very cold, the, the, the ice is stable there. And they may be fairly shallow so you can mine them. The problem is getting there, right? So we know there is water there from different uh, uh, observations that happened uh, in the last decade or so. By impacting the moon, 
creating a dust plume and analyzing these dust plumes. So we know there is water, but we've never been able to verify exactly where and, in what and how to model it. So, so having some, a rover there, go there and, and explore them is, is critical. And there has been actually a mission which was supposed to take place in 2018 called the Resource uh, 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 Prospector that has been canceled a month ago, but it was supposed to be done this year. So that rover goes and digs about a, a meter deep in Earth, collects all the uh, a sample of, of the moon uh, minerals, uh, and then does all kinds of experiments and fuses them and melts them and whatever to collect all the various components and, and return the signals to Earth. So that has been replaced by another privately funded program. One of them actually is funded by Google. It's called PriceX, or XPrice actually. And uh, it's, uh, it's uh, several million dollars for whoever lands a rover on the moon and goes 500 meters and takes pictures. So anyway, so landers are in rovers. So we know we need to get there. Um, how can we plan it? So there are several constraints on the moon. One is that the rover has to see the Earth because it receives guidance from Earth about where to go. It's, it's driven from Earth. The second thing is it has to see the sun periodically, maybe once every, for a certain period every week, so that it can recharge the batteries to go forward. And it cannot climb very uphill or very steep slopes. So it has to have also a constraint on slopes. So it's, it's quite complex to, to basically define that traverse and guide the, the rover there. Uh, right now, the rover goes eight miles an hour or max, but it spends 90% of its time waiting for a signal from Earth about where to go. Uh, that's one of the problems that we want to do, which is automatic traverse planning and possibly self-guidance. Well, it can guide itself. So when we started doing this uh, project, that was the initial intent. And then we ran into a lot of, a lot of issues. F the first is availability of maps. So in order to be able to do the traverse planning and to do the uh, autonomous driving there, you need to have at least an idea of what the terrain looks like. Um, there are a couple of um, systems where, which you can detect uh, um, the uh, elevations. One is the digital elevation model, uh, DEM. Uh, these are coming from stereo cameras, and uh, so you can get 3D from the stereo cameras, and they are adjusted with laser altimeters. They're very precise, but low resolution. Uh, but the narrow angle camera is very, gives you accuracy within a meter but then it's not stereo. So it has to do it as it orbits a second time or third time to get this kind of accuracy for 3D. But as you can see, there are a lot of artifacts when you start merging all these images together. And uh, we found out that these maps were very, very hard to, to deal with. So in summary, the problem is that we need to go and, uh, to the moon and the maps are really difficult to deal with. And uh, as a consequence, preparing that data is really a lot of work. So most of the project actually had to resolve these issues. So one of uh, the artifacts from the maps are well-known problems. They are dealt with also with on satellite images on Earth and things like this. So we reused several of the classical techniques there to try to improve the maps a little bit. But still, we notice that even when you improve the maps, the, uh, the maps are still missing craters, they're not allocated, they're not labeled, and things like this. So it was very hard to, even with the good maps, to make a sense of it. So the next step was to get more accurate maps. And for this, we need to detect all the different craters from the images and label them so we avoid them in the, in the traverse. And that's, the, that's what I want to talk about right now. So people have been looking for craters on the moon for a long time using very different techniques. And we 
found at least 77 papers on this, including actually after this talk, there have been several more using uh, neural networks. Anyway, so, um, uh, so the project that we try to do is really to use a uh, deep learning method to try to identify these craters. So the problem is that uh, in, on the moon, particularly in the polar region, when you have, the light is very shallow, very low. So the, the shadows have a tremendous impact on the, on the image. So you see big areas of blacks, things like this. The craters change dramatically uh, from one run to the next. Very different perspectives. On the equator, it's a bit less uh, pronounced. The second thing is you have very small craters also that are important, and some craters overlap. So we had to detect all of these different combinations. So we, uh, NASA has a lot of data. That's one of the good things working with NASA. They have 30 years or more of the worth of data from different passes of different lunar orbiters, different spectral densities, uh, light and infrared and whatever. So uh, we were able to get uh, several thousand styles of these uh, images, which represent maybe several kilometers by several kilo kilometers. Uh, from NASA, from JPL as well. And also we got uh, several annotated craters. They say, okay, this is a crater and this is a box around it and this is the kind of crater. Uh, so these are the things that we, ha we had to deal with. On the tiles, there was a lot of pre-processing to do, as, as I mentioned about. So we did two things. One is uh, we were trying to see whether we can accurately predict all these craters. Uh, the second one is to look at the big tiles and detect all the craters that were there. So the first one was a classification problem, the second one was a detection problem. The, uh, during the, the project, it was an eight week project, they only were able to do a portion of this quite well. So for, uh, they focused mostly on the, on the detection and then after the project was ended, they continued working with Intel and we improved it with the, uh, with the detection problem. So, uh, there were two, as I mentioned, there were two types of craters, equatorial and polar. They looked fairly different. Uh, and uh, when you apply a CNN, a, conv a convolutional neural network networks, you immediately see a huge improvement in performance compared to traditional machine learning techniques. Uh, it's not the first time this happens, but they were able to get roughly 98% of precision uh, compared to previous techniques, which were like around 86 to 90 percent. So that was not surprising, but also we needed to scale it up to the large, to the large uh, uh, tiles. So anyway, also an interesting point was that if you use the equatorial data to predict equatorial uh, craters, you were able to get about 95 percent accuracy. And if you try to predict, the, use the equatorial data to predict polar, you get about 90. But then polar on polar, you get uh, 98. And when you use both, you get quite much improved accuracy. So uh, having bo both sets of data helped, even though the equatorial uh, polar uh, craters were quite different. So uh, as I mentioned, uh, there's also the impact of speed up. When you have such huge amount of data to deal with, you cannot just have somebody count the craters like what was being done before. You really need to have an automation. And, and that allowed the automation. So the next step is, okay, now we can, if, you, if, you, if I give you an image of a crater, you can tell me it's a crater or it's not a crater. But uh, can we detect all the crater of an image? And that's the object detection problem. And for this, we used a single shot detection. Um, if you're not very familiar with this technique, I'm gonna quickly summarize it. So single shot means you, you see the image once. Um, there are different, approaches where you can uh, look at different areas of an image and then classify each image, but that's very slow. So single shot is you, sh you put the image once and the neural network itself identifies both the regions of interest and classifies them. And for this, we, um, we used uh, the SSD network, which is the, uh, it starts like a convolutional VGG16 network, but then each pixel towards the end are, is associated with a set of boxes or regions, it's called the prior regions, which uh, are candidates for detection of objects. And you can train that network to identify the 
regions at the same time as you can classify them. Um, the, the changes that we made for this network to be able to work for small and large uh, craters was to change the distribution of priors that are in, in standard uh, uh, SSD networks. So we had to change that the small regions versus the large region and the different shapes of regions. Uh, the second thing we needed to do also is to change the, the scale of the image itself. Typically, you use either 224 by 224 or larger or smaller. So we had to in, uh, uh, use much larger uh, images in order, in order to enable good accuracy for small craters. So anyway, so the results was like uh, was about 90%. Uh, uh, training precision, about the 78% uh, percent, uh, um, uh, pre uh, detection rate for uh, unlabeled data, which was much better than actually a, uh, the human uh, labeler. So what next? So that was last year's challenge. So this year, uh, the challenge that we're going to have, which is going to start in a month, actually, is can we take these maps that we know from, that we have processed and we know are, are there and uh, fuse them with, with uh, computer images coming from the rover itself? Can we uh, use these two sources of data to localize the rover where it is and let the rover identify where to go next? So that's uh, essentially the, the challenge that we're going to do this, uh, this uh, summer. And then, uh, based on this, we will, there will be another project, which is the traverse planning. Um, how to plan the next, uh, the route to, to meet both the constraints uh, that we need to do, as well as the objectives. So there are other projects that are also being looked at right now. One is, once we get there and we start mining, what, are, what kind of analytics we need to do on this? Um, should we have something decide where to dig next and, and do all these different decision points? Uh, there's also another problem, which is when you start mining in low gravity, dust goes up and you have a lot of other constraints, especially when the soil is very dusty, you might also go uh, sink in it. So there are a lot of um, uh, problems that we need to model there, and that might be one uh, aspect of the, of the mining that uh, we can do for um, based on data there. Uh, resilient computing is, a, is one that's a little bit different. That's the fact that when you have computers in space, they are subject to cosmic rays, and you start getting a lot of uh, uh, soft errors, uh, soft error rates. So how can we um, ensure that the results are reliable even when you have uh, random errors happening periodically. And uh, the, this is a problem that has been tackled for a while on Earth, uh, but uh, on the moon it becomes much more important. Uh, luckily, actually, neural networks are fairly resilient to these kind of things, as long as you don't have a blue screen. But, uh, but uh, there are techniques to sort of, we, we need to evaluate exactly how to, to deal with all these problems when you get there. So anyway, uh, I want to leave you with one thing. There's, there's a game that was created after this to help label some of the creators and get more data. So uh, uh, if you feel like playing a game, you can go there, you get shots of the moon, and you, have, you can label uh, creators as you go, and it's a, it's a fun game if you have the time. So. <laughs> Anyway, so that's, uh, that's my talk, and uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. Uh, it looks like we have one question. Uh, thanks for this uh, 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 session, and the uh, question is, so uh, you were saying that you're creating this SSD network and dividing original image on the pieces and then apply uh, uh, the first part of the uh, your task to, uh, to answer the question, is it this part of the image crater or not? And the question is, how do you divide the image? You, you don't divide the image. So uh, there are different uh, networks that, does, that do uh, object detection, right? 
Some of them have a search on the boxes. So you have many candidate boxes and you select a box, you repeat, right? This is like RCNN, but we're, we're, uh, SSD is very different. YOLO and SSD are two different techniques that are used for uh, object detection. They look at the image once. So you take the whole image and then based on the weights and what you have learned during the training, it automatically identified, identifies candidate boxes. So it's a single shot uh, process. So training is harder uh, because you have to learn at the same time the, uh, the boxes, but its uh, inference is much faster. Hello, thank you for the presentation. So I have a question here is, um, is do we have a plan to actually um, scale up this to another planet and how hard it is? <laughs> okay, uh, there are other people looking at landing a rover, not a rover, but landing something on asteroids. Uh, so they've been, that's another possibility. Okay. And Mar I think people are also trying to uh, mine on Mars right now. Yes. So, Thank you. Uh, so it's, uh, I don't know when it's going to happen, but people have been talking about it. Okay. Uh, one more comment. There are a lot of startups actually looking at doing something in that space because uh, 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 now that we have uh, uh, much more controlled rockets that can even go and come back and do things like this, finding suitable landing sites is important and having uh, something like this to, to detect suitable landing sites is really critical. Um, I had a question about um, okay. when you're working on the moon on a lunar rover, right, you're gonna have limited power, limited compute, limited memory, limited everything. So uh, is there some kind of efficiency requirement on some of these algorithms that you've had to work under? There will be. Uh, we haven't, <laughs> they haven't tackled this, but uh, uh, rovers obviously have to go with low power. Uh, now, if you look at, for example, some of the hardware that are used for inference on the edge, uh, I'll give you an example, is Movidius uh, from Intel. which It's a compute vision chip that is developed for wearables or drones or for IoT applications. They run for less than a watt. And actually, also have in some of the hardware that we provide on, on the client side, you have uh, IPs now being on, on the chip, which are roughly hundreds of milliwatts. So it is possible to have that level of power and do quite powerful uh, um, deep learning. <laughs> okay. So, so the question is, uh, why don't we use drones to, to explore? Uh, there's no atmosphere. <laughs> okay, that's one, one, one answer. But then there's also the idea of using um, uh, swarms of uh, possible uh, either rovers or, um, I don't know, that allows you to explore multiple areas and talk to each other and try to locate areas. So that's another application, one of the challenges for, for exploration this year. Hi, thank you for an interesting talk. Um, I was wondering, what about other um, imaging, uh, like radar or something like that, to augment those areas where the sunlight is at a very oblique angle? They already do that. So that's some of the images I showed you, especially in the poles, are all based on, on uh, different uh, uh, tec techniques. They have new neutron measurements and... Uh, Any other questions? All right, thank you. You've all been great. Let's do another round of applause.